God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Mm. Praise did, team did a great job this morning, don't you think? <laughs> Children, you're dismissed. You can go with Miss Kayla this morning. Uh, as the kids are leaving, I just want to make uh, an announcement. Uh, I want to introduce somebody this morning. It's very special. This is a new member of our family. And wait a minute, come over here. Wait a minute, Claire, you come over here, and then you can go back in just a minute. Uh, Laura, you come out here, stand in the middle. <laughs> stand, right, stand right there. This is Sayla Jane Dorning. And this is... <laughs> this is her first Sunday in church. First of every Sunday for the rest of her life. Amen? Amen. And I just wanted to introduce you to let you know who she is. Not that you wouldn't know by any other means, but I just wanted to introduce you. Thank you, Laura. Claire, you can go, you can go with Miss Katie. Thank you. This morning, if you have your Bibles, we're in the book of Matthew. And it's amazing how coordinated God is, don't you think? He's very um, coordinated and intentional in all that he does. We're studying, actually, uh, um, in man church, how to pursue God. And one of the things that uh, Rick Burgess does in our, our, our Bible study, he reads Scripture from different places. And last week, he was in the Beatitudes. And he was talking a little bit about salt and light. And this morning, as I alluded to you earlier, we talked about, and we started in Matthew chapter 5 and started the Sermon on the Mount, on the Beatitudes, and we talked about the blessedness that we are. Blessed. Jesus describes just about in every category that you could find yourself, Jesus said, you are blessed. And that's sometimes very difficult for us to understand. It's very difficult for us to get our arms around, our mind around, and actually live it. Because we're so driven by the circumstance, we're so driven by what we have to do in order to accommodate the circumstance we find ourselves, and to overcome the circumstance that we find ourselves. And a lot of times we miss the fact that we're blessed. We're not blessed because of the circumstance, but we're blessed in the midst of it because God is there with us. He's our ever-present, ever-present. Say ever-present. Ever He's our ever-present help in the time of need. And we're blessed because of His presence. We're blessed because of who He is and what He's done for us and what He sees and what He knows from our heart. This morning's reading is uh, chapter 5, verse 13. It reads this way. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, this is where we're going to land today, but this is a two-part series that next Sunday we'll be talking about the next text following that, talking about the light. You are the light of the world. And these are two profound metaphors that Jesus is describing his followers on the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was in his ministry of three years when he walked the earth. They were important metaphors because they were important elements that related to that people and still to this day relate to us in a very important way. Let's pray and then we'll unpack some of this. Father, we welcome your spirit in this place. Holy Spirit, we just sung about you your presence, and we welcome you to move freely in the hearts and lives of your people. So Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts that we may see, hear, and understand, and then have the courage, the courage to apply. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. salt is a very big thing and the biblical times, especially in the Old Testament, but it carries over in the New Testament as well. And by the way, salt is still a very big issue today. Amen? It, does, it has not lost its value. It just has a few more uh, 
applications and implications about how we use it. Salt is mentioned over 40 times in Scripture. Most of the time, it is mentioned in covenants, and it is mentioned as favor, and it's mentioned also in challenge. Salt is um, a wonderful element in the fact that it is a compound. It is in a solid form called rock salt, but it also can be dissolved and also be present in many liquid forms like the sea or the ocean. How many of you have been to the beach, got into the ocean, and you got some water in your mouth? What did you taste? It wasn't the fish. You t- tasted the salt because salt is a very heavy presence. It's an amazing element as well because salt, even when dissolved, if you boil the water out of the salt water again, the salt then becomes crystallized again and takes on the solid form, making it nearly an indestructible element. It's amazing. It really is amazing. Salt in the Bible has a great importance and used as metaphors in a lot of different ways. There's seven basic ways that it's used. Salt is used as an act in the covenant, sealed with the covenant. Chronicles, Leviticus, and Numbers all have uh, the God or Jehovah covenant that he places with his people, and they're sealed and they're signed by salt. Salt salt is also uh, used as a, uh, a symbol of friendship and loyalty. Salt is a, a, a preservative and has these qualities. Uh, salt is a valued mineral. It's been used to exchange and has value in how people live their lives and what they do with it. So, uh, salt is a source of nourishment. It helps us, and, and it helps us in many ways because it not only adds taste But actually, the taste is there, but what it prominently does, it breaks down the fibers in the food that we put it in, and it releases and amplifies the taste that's already present in the food. That's what salt does. Salt is also a component of fertilizer because it also breaks down some of the nutrients that causes harms in fertilizer, and it releases, as it hits the grounds, the nutrients in which makes the plants respond and grow. Salt simply adds flavor. So the question to us is, when Jesus uses this metaphor and he says that we're losing our saltiness, or what good is salt when it uses its saltiness, then it's a challenge. It, it's, it's something that we should take personally in the fact that we're a steward of this salt, this mineral that has value, this mineral that does so many different things in our life that some of them we're not even aware of. But Jesus points this out and uses it as a metaphor to get our attention to say, look, you're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. And the salt of the earth in those days meant that, meant that there was so many implications to what that saltiness looked like and actually how it was applied to each person's life. When I was in Germany, I went to a salt mine. Everybody ever gone to a salt mine? I did. It was amazing because as we went to the salt mine, I got there to the mine and they didn't have any elevators or anything. So what they did was you put a little leather skirt on that came down and covered this side. And then you would get on this slide and you would slide down to the different levels in which you were working. And man, I'm going to tell you, that was fun. I enjoyed that. What I didn't enjoy was the hike back up. That was not. However, we went down in the mines in the, 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 this, this rock salt mine, and it was white. It had salt everywhere. And it, it was basically so very interesting of all the things they do with salt. And, of course, me, being who I am, I go to the wall and I lick it. And you know what? It's salt. I just wanted to make sure. And it was salt. And, and one of the guys over there said, man, that's nasty. What in the world are you looking at for? I said, it's salt. It preserves. It, it's, it sanctifies. It, it sanitizes. It does everything. It's salt, man. It ain't going to hurt you. Come here, have a lick. No, I ain't licking it. 
So we, we had a licking contest there for a while, but, but anyway, it was salty. Here's what they said. They said this meister that was showing us the salt mine, he said, look, salt never loses its saltiness or its composition because salt is a compound. The only reason that salt may become less salty like in the walls or somewhere else is when there are other contaminants that are present. Are you listening? So the walls in, on the upper level, when you lick them, you notice that the walls were not as salty as they are down here on the lower levels because in the lower levels there's not as many contaminants to affect the pureness of the salt. It's, it's kind of interesting, don't you think? When Jesus says that when the salt loses its saltiness, it's not talking about the salt. It's talking about the contaminants that we have allowed to penetrate or they have allowed to penetrate into their lives. You see, the salt never loses that. The salt is still present. We are called to be the salt of the earth with all the characteristics and all the things that it does to our community. Salt. The only time we lose our effectiveness, the only time that we see us less salty is when we have allowed the world to come and contaminate us and take us off our course. Redirect us from what we're called to be. Saltiness. Saltiness also has a great amount of application. First, when you use a little bit of salt, it's very good for your personal body. It helps your body to absorb the nutrients that it's supposed to. And it also provides some, you know, firing capabilities when your syntax and all kinds of different things that makes your motors run. It actually helps that when you're your uh, when your uh, sodium and and your uh, potash gets a little bit low potassium gets a little bit low your synapses don't fire as great and, and as efficient salt helps that process so salt has a purpose in, in our lives and, and but too much salt too much salt has another effect because you know what lived around the salt mines there you know what was on top of the salt mines that grew? Absolutely nothing. Because it couldn't grow anything. When too much salt is present, it becomes dangerously non-productive in the growth aspect. However, it takes on another attribute that is profoundly important. It's called a preservative. Hmm. Listen to this. When I was growing up, we killed hogs on the farm. Anybody ever done that? Okay. We're, our generation is about, we're, we're, we're leaving this world, okay? And most people now find salty bacon inside the freezer section of Publix. Got that. Or just the shelf, because really it needs no refrigeration. Why? Because of the salt. We would kill hogs, and we would quarter it up and clean it up, and then we would put it in these salt boxes, and we would layer it, and we would have about three or four inches of salt. We'd put a ham or shoulder in, and then we'd put another two or three inches of salt, and then we'd put another ham or shoulder or butt or whatever we were curing, and we'd put that and put a layer of salt, and we would let that remain for about six weeks. And that process, we would come out every once in a while and check, making sure how much the salt has penetrated the meat. Because see, in its concentration of that saltiness, it kills all living things, even the pests and, the, and the, all the things that the organisms that would make us sick. It sterilizes and preserves that meat. So after six weeks, we take the hams out, we put twine around the bit, hang them up in a smokehouse, and we start a small fire with no chimney because we're wanting to keep the smoke in the house. It's just a little smoke. All we want is smoke. We don't want any heat or anything else. So we start this fire and let it just on a, on a dirt floor, some rocks around it, shut the door, and let it smolder for days on end. And then we let it go out, and it's there. 
in the dead of winter when we have three degrees. And by the way, region seven is what region we're in. But occasionally we get three degree weather, don't we? We just did. Killed about every plant we've got. Okay, we're going to have another plant offering in the spring to try to replace some of our plants, I guess. I don't know. But all of them, well, I'm hoping they'll come back out. Because God is the God of resurrection. Amen? Amen. (laughs) We're grateful for that. It preserves. So when you have a concentration of salt, it helps preserve so you will sustain in your life. Now, you say, preacher, why is that so important? Now, get this. What does Jesus say to the church? He says, forsake not the assembly together of the saints. Right? Does it say that? Hello, are y'all listening to me? Does it say that in Scripture? And he says we're the salt of the world, right? And when we go out there, we're supposed to add flavor. We're supposed to be an asset. We're supposed to do these incredible things that salt brings to life. We're supposed to be that to the world. And we're not supposed to allow the world in enough to contaminate us, but we're supposed to be infused into the world enough that we help overcome things for them in the life. And then he says, now I want all the salt to come together in a concentrated place. Place. Because when you come together in a concentrated, consecrated place and a concentrated matter, you will be preserved. Are y'all listening to me at all? This is salt box for us. This is preservation for us. This is what we must have to be able to survive as a church and a people of God. And while we forsake it, And become so deluded in our effectiveness to Christ, only God knows. Because I sure don't. So the question is today, are we the salt that God has placed in us to be what we're supposed to be to the world? And are we coming together to let our salt accumulate and come together that we can be preserved as agents of God, that we can go back out in the world and do better. Which is it? As for me and my household, we serve the Lord. That's what Jeremiah says. But there's so many times that my flesh doesn't want to. How about yours? Last Sunday morning, it was rainy, it was cold, my bed felt so good. And I said to myself, I think I'm going to call in sick. I don't want to go to church. Then it dawned on me I was the pastor. Y'all ever had that thought? Amen. When I got to church, I saw most of you. And you know what happened to me in my heart? I got encouraged. We had some people here last week I hadn't seen in a long time. And boy, that encouraged me, thrilled me. And some of the people that I see every Sunday still thrills me and encourages me. And you know, when I left that Sunday, I felt better. And I was so glad that I came to church. How about you? You see, this is that perseverance. This is that preservation. This is those things that draw us together because we need each other To be able to survive out there. The world is trying to kill us, to steal from us, and to destroy us. But it's when we come and we listen to the Word of God that boils our heart again to set us on fire, that the salt is reconstituted, that we become 
more effective out there. You say, well, why, why are you, how do, where did you get that? Why, why do you say that? Not only the scientists, not only the people that talk about that, not only the guy that was in the salt mine that says that, but Mark chapter 9 says this. Everyone will be salted with fire. Say fire. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other and let God's fire purify. Woo! Man, that's good. We come together in a consecrated and a concentrated effect to allow the saltiness of God, the worth of God, the value of God to be realized in our life. And when we lose our saltiness, Scripture said, how do we regain our salty? It's through the fire of the Holy Ghost. It's through the fire of the Holy Spirit. It's through the passion and the love of God that boils away the contaminants of the world and sets the concentration of the value of the salt of the covenant of everything God has placed within us back in you again so we will be effective out there and that's why it's so important we meet in here I'm kind of passionate about that because we are supposed to be the salt and I'm going to tell you I don't know what news you've been watching and what world you've been living in but we need some salt. Amen? Be the salt. Add value, flavor, worth. Because this is what God has called us to do. And it's about time we started remembering that. This morning we're going to remember what Jesus did for us. On the cross, what he did for us in the court, and what he did for us through the grave. This morning we're going to receive Holy Communion. It's where we come to the table as Christ had the disciples to come together to share the Passover meal. The Passover meal was served to the children of Israel as a reminder of God's providence and provision as, they, as he delivered them from the land of bondage out of Egypt. And Jesus met with his disciples on the last year of his ministry, right before he was given up. And he instituted this supper called the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. There's many words for it. It all means the same thing. He took common bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he used it as a metaphor to represent his body that would be broken, bruised, and battered for our transgressions, our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed, according to Scripture. He used the wine we celebrate with juice to represent the blood of Christ. The blood that says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin, which means there is no washing away of sin. Not only is there forgiveness but there is a washing away of sin. He places our sin as far apart from us as the east is in the west. And you have to remember that when the world wants to say your salt is impure, you have to understand because what Jesus did and what he said, what he went through, your salt is good if you'll serve him and be sold out to him. Also serves as a second thing. See, it's also the remission, the washing away of sin, but it's also a covenant marker between us and the Father. Jesus says, this will mark a new covenant between you and my Father. You see, wine stains. Juice stains. Have you ever had grape juice on your shirt? You know, I, I don't know why, but it seems like I need a bib now. When, every time I eat, it seems like I get stuff on my shirts all the time. And it stains. The juice, the wine, marks us. It stains us. And it shows to everybody, all the world, especially to the Father, that we're His.
We have covenant now with God. So we come to the table. We remember everything that Jesus went through because he loved us. We also remember the benefits we get because of his love for us, the remission of sin. And we also remember our status, that we are his. We're marked. And that's something to remember. Always. Always. This morning, prepare your hearts to receive, to remember, and to be restored. Father, we thank you for these elements this morning. Pour out your spirit upon them that they may be for us the body that was broken and the blood that was shed, that it may stain us and mark us, Lord, afresh and anew, that we will have covenant with you. Bless us as we remember and receive. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. This morning, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to ask everybody, to, we're going to go aisle by aisle by aisle from front to back. We're going to ask you to come down the center aisle. I'll be 